Okay, let's get started on uh, Jude 22 and 23, specifically verse 23, which comprises part two of Contending for the Faith. The uh, title is Reprove or Rapture. And based on uh, probably the most accurate understanding I could come up with, there's two groups here. Uh, on the one hand, there are some who are disputing, uh, usually the false teachers and their followers. You uh, need to be able to reprove them, bring to light their error, and uh, hopefully guide them in uh, truth. But others, the second group, um, you need to save with fear. And this saving is pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So by denying the lordship of Jesus, they have basically defiled themselves, they have disqualified themselves from worship, um, and they are headed for destruction, um, probably of the Gehenna, not an eternal punishment, but a destruction of uh, all they gave their souls for. So we're going to look today at how to save them, uh, how you, what fear enters into it, and uh, a little bit of the snatching away. Snatching away is the word for rapture, um, which is uh, something that I, well, we'll look at when we get there. So, from just by review of the Roman numerals from last week, contending for the faith requires preparation. You've got to prepare spiritually, mentally, uh, and even physically by your lifestyle. Then it requires performance. And even if you do the things you, you know, are most convinced are the right things to do, uh, you have to persevere prayerfully uh, to eventually get the prize. So we are going to look at some of that preparation uh, in terms of how to save people in the process uh, in part two. But also in part two, uh, just like with those who are disputing uh, you need to start at the low volume. You know, treat others as you would want to be treated. It's very, very simple. Uh, put a few crumbs of uh, truth out there and test the response, and then you can kind of know if you're dealing with a fool or a wise person or one who wants to uh, walk with God or just wallow in their mire. Uh, the process normally, in the context of some sort of relationship, is you teach, you encourage, uh, parakaleo, call them to uh, follow the teaching. Uh, then you admonish or warn, same word, put them in their right mind. It implies that people are out of their minds, usually the case. Uh, reprove is bringing to light normally with evidence. Rebuke is telling them you're just flat out wrong. Um, it's the old turn or burn. And then finally there is the rejection. And that's all part of our worship of God and our love of others. God does all this with us. And he is all love. So we looked at bit about how to do that last week, some of the words that fit in there, some of the requirements to do it. And then a reminder that dueling with demons requires discernment. Uh, you can't just blindly say the truth and no, no, you're not doing that. It, like You really need to get in touch with the Holy Spirit, um, which is why he had told us earlier in the previous section that we need to be praying in the Spirit. We need to get the Spirit's perspective on things um, and guidance throughout the process. And lastly, we just touched on this. Uh, this will be part of a series following Jude. We need to acquire the uh, ammunition we need for admonishment. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, and we look at some of the things in Genesis that Satan um, fills people's minds with in terms of objecting to what God said. And then we look at some of the specific things that relate to lordship. I'll be it briefly. So now we go to part two. Others, uh, these are different people who are actively disputing. These are people who are just like clueless. Uh, you need to save the fear. We'll have a whole section on that. And they're basically like the frog in the water that's getting boiled. They don't really know the dangers that they face. You need to wake them up. And uh, the process is actually uh, not pleasant. Um, because you're dealing with someone that is basically defiled, and you don't want to make sure, want to make sure that it doesn't affect you either. So, Roman number five, we must, it's like an imperative kind of thing, 
save others by understanding their needs and using God's process and motivations for sanctification. And God's motivation for sanctification is both positive and negative. Look at Deuteronomy. He wanted a holy people. And uh, as you look at how he tried to get that holy people, he gave them commands, and then he said, if you obey them, I will bless you. This is how I'll bless you. But if you disobey me, this is how I'll curse you. So God uses more negative motivation than positive motivation. And our culture has totally uh, rejected negative motivation because in our culture's highest value is having people feel good. And we don't want to have them not feel good because then they won't come back. Um, one of the biggest revivals in history was sparked by Jonathan Edwards, who uh, has a sermon, you can read it online. He used to read it in almost a monotone, holding the manuscript up to his face with a candle and drone on about uh, sinners in the hand of an angry God. And people would grasp their seats lest they fall, slip over the edge of their seats into perdition because he painted such a vivid picture of the hell that awaited those who uh, dissed God. And the Holy Spirit used that um, incredibly to spark a revival across the nation. Um, a lot of people just try to use that same motivation, but they kind of miss the process and methods that God has outlined. There's times for that, and there are times to do other things. If you want to be unpopular, um, pose the following lie and truth to your Christian friends and listen to what their responses are. Oh, and duck any stones that are headed your way. Here's a lie that I believe is commonly believed. I believe that's commonly, I can do that. I can please God without striving to become like Christ. Well, he saved us to be conformed to his image, to be able to rule with him, to be holy like him. And uh, we are told to run, to win, to strive, Paul, for example. So that's pretty obvious that you can't please God by just striving to please yourself. And the second part of that, I can become Christ-like without reprogramming my responses and values and actions to be like his. You want to make it so that you're response to the things of life, your response to other people, is automatic. And that means you have a robot inside you that accounts for 90% of your automatic decisions that's got all the wrong programming, it's got all the wrong values. And unless you sit down and evaluate it, uh, hold it up against the scripture, and extinguish it from your life. There's a sermon called, Ain't Gonna Raid No More. It's how to reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God. And that describes the process of becoming like Christ, how you're transformed by the renewal of your mind, how you put up the old before you put on the new. This requires work. And unless you actually get to the values, that's really key, you'll have the wrong actions and the wrong responses. Um, ask a couple of Christians you know what they think about that one. Don't tell them it's a lie. <laughs> I heard this in my ser a sermon this week. Uh, what do you think of it? Uh, people who believe this lie are headed to certain judgment and certain fire. Um, all that they gave their life to is really wood, hay, and stubble. And if you think about it, most of the stuff that is in our lives is just the stuff that's not going to last. Uh, our jobs, our bank account, our relationships. Uh, some of those relationships might last. Uh, the way in which we go about performing our job, that will last. That's what we're going to be judged on. Uh, how much money we make, that's not going to be an issue. Nowhere do I see that in um, the scriptures. And what do we give most of our life to? Stuff that's all going to be burned anyway. So most believers are in this category. They will suffer loss. It's a promise from God's word. Uh, they'll be saved. This does not mean you're not a believer. Uh, it's contrary to the incorrect lordship salvation teachers. Uh, you have your sins forgiven by believing in Jesus, but your life is a loss. Let's contrast that with the second thing, the truth. Here's the truth. You'll get lots of pushback on this one. Fear of God is essential. Oh no, we're not supposed to fear God. We're just supposed to love him, says the pious 
thinner. Um, it's essential for sanctification, you can find verses for all these, for godliness, for pleasing God, for walking in wisdom, basically for living uh, the life God wants us to live. And those who wish otherwise are fools. Wishing otherwise is to be a fool. Um, I was going to say thinking, but it's not even thinking. That's wishing. <laughs> it's wishing, believing in something that is just a pipe dream. It's not going to be reality. It will never be reality. So if you don't have fear of God, you are a total loser in the Christian life. And uh, you regret it eternally. It's you know, all over the scriptures. If you've never seen that, I would suggest that you're demonically deceived. It's not for this audience. It's for those who may be listening. Or hearing on my, uh, let me replay this. So it said, save with fear. Uh, Jude has a lot of uh, difficult passages, both in terms of understanding the text, and even if you have to figure out that, okay, this is the right text, what it means is all over the place. Um, we'll see another passage, maybe two more passages like that today, that are outside uh, Jude. So the first, and I think the most viable option, viable means workable, livable, um, is save by means of fear. And the matter is uh, eating uh, even the flesh, I mean the garment that's defiled by the flesh. Uh, hating the garment defiled by the flesh is not the means of saving them, it's the matter. And the only means that is given in this passage is using fear. So we'll look at two different other options for this, but this one I think is pretty good. So using fear of God and his promised consequences and penalty as a motivator. The reason I think this is most uh, likely is because that's what Jude does in 5 through 15. The bulk of the letter is giving motivation to um, not deny Christ's lordship. Uh, I remind you, even though you already know to do this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not continue to believe. 1 Corinthians 10 says the same thing. If you don't know 1 Corinthians 10, you should. So it's most likely that you take the enter into the author's mind, he is using fear as the motivation, fear of negative consequences, for um, turning from the lie and embracing the truth and obeying God and living under his lordship. Some verses on this, um, if you read the proverb of the day, you, you know, should, this should be a, you might not know the exact reference, but these verses should all sound really familiar. Fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, and it's a fountain, fear of the Lord is the means by which you depart from the snares of death. Uh, back in the dark ages, it took me, uh, my kids who qualify for nationals, the debate and the speech and other things down to Bob Jones University. And to get from one spot to the other, you had to walk across a you know, nice pond they had created with a fountain in it and a bridge. So you walked over the bridge, and if it was a windy day, you could actually get damp and spray. And I guess some uh, enlightened, rich uh, alumni had uh, do, uh, donated the money for it. But it had Proverbs 24, 20, 14, 27 written on this fountain. <laughs> Remember a fountain? This is a fear of the Lord is a fountain that causes you to depart from the snares of death. Satan uses snares, things that you don't look like they're bad, they look like they're good, just like a, you, know, you never trap a bird by saying, a bird trap here. Um, it's hidden, and we put our neck and feet into those snares. And the fear of the Lord is the thing that keeps us from doing that. By hesed and faithfulness, iniquity is purged. The correct translations or inaccurate translations are uh, crossed out. Um, hesed is covenantal faithfulness, but we are faithful to his covenant and we are uh, faithful to his uh, truth. Our iniquity is removed from our lives. And by the fear of the Lord, men, women, and children depart from evil. So kids need discipline to depart from evil. Uh, you can only reason with them so much. And uh, you can spend the rest of your life reasoning with them. You probably see this in the grocery stores. Um, 
I love the t-shirt that said, because I'm the mommy, that's why. <laughs> why? 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 Uh, I'm the mommy, that's why. And I have a spatula. <laughs> in fine print, and you can't use that anymore. Yeah, anymore. The wise man fears and departs from evil. But the fool, this is a fool. Someone who's wise in their own eyes, rages on, doesn't depart from evil, and is confident that the way they're going is right. And boy, are they going to be shocked. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Okay, so I hate evil. Pride, arrogance, those are evil. The evil way. The forward mouth. Work a forward mouth. That's what that says for verse things. I hate that stuff because I've embraced God's value. Paul uses this motivation as well in 2 Corinthians 7 1. When he talks about all that God has planned for us, if we are holy and follow him, having these promises, positive motivation, let us cleanse ourselves. Middle, we do it. Didn't happen at the cross. If you don't do it, you still stink. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and Wow, you can have a filthy spirit. Your mind, your will, and your emotions are an abomination in God's sight, even though outwardly you look you know, pretty good. So you're, you're a clean, moral person. People say, oh, wow, you're a nice person. But God thinks you stink. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God doesn't want us to be just a little holy. We're supposed to be holy as he is holy. It's something we're supposed to perfect, to make perfect. Uh, you think of all the work you put in a big report that's going into your boss and you want to make sure it's just right. So you have that same diligence and concern for detail to, you know, when you appear before your big boss in the sky. Fear of God. Promises, positive. Fear of God, negative. Um, so those are ways to remind people that where they're headed is not in their best interest. Remember, love is doing what's in someone's best interest. So uh, try out those truths and lies with people. Um, we got some verses to show the fear of God is a thing. Another option which is possible is we save others because we fear God. So we're the ones fearing God. And uh, just two verses, one verse, well, two, two verses, one passage on this. Uh, Paul says, he makes it his ambition, his primary ambition in life to please God. Um, that should be our primary ambition too. And then the reason, because we all got to appear before the Bema or judgment seat of Christ. What's going to happen there? Well, each of us is going to receive payback for what we've done in, our, in the body. Yeah, what we have done, whether good or bad. If we've done good, we get good. If we've done bad, we get bad. And we reference Luke 12, if this is a new concept for you, read the whole chapter. Okay, therefore, conclusion, knowing the fear, this translation, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The thing that motivated Paul to persuade people to be reconciled to God, which 521 eventually gets to, is the terror of the Lord. And it follows, verse 11, his judgment. Now, it could be, you know, knowing the fear of the Lord that others should have, we persuade them because we don't want bad things to happen to them. Um, that's possible, but it doesn't really account for all the data. Um, there's time to reject. There's time to shake the dust off your feet. So uh, this fear, I think it's most reasonable to say, it applies to us before the judgment seat. Just like the fear above is the erring ensnared believer before the judgment seat. And then some people say it's fearing defilement, and this is also something to keep in mind. Uh, the thing that we fear is defilement because it says, save with fear, hating even the garment, um, lest we be contaminated by it and disqualified for worship. So we got to watch out that in the process, we don't become like the people that we're interacting with um, and this has some, some good biblical basis as well. Um, it's, the reference was that you could not enter into the temple to worship God, 
to have him hear your prayers, which he promised he would hear, hear if you made them at the specific spot he specified in the Old Testament. New Testament, you're free to pray at any time, anywhere. Um, and if you touch something that was unclean, you became unclean and you couldn't be put in. In fact, they had guards at the gates to make sure that you weren't dis, you know, uh, disqualified, coming in with blood or something that was improper. Uh, so, fearing the defilement, um, one of the modern terms, the way this happens, and I have mixed uh, emotions, to, dare I say feelings about this one. Uh, the phrase, hate the sin but love the sinner, is actually pretty good. Um, yet there comes a point where you reject the sinner out of love. So, yes, yeah, sin can be odious, we really hate it, but we have a love for the sinner that causes us to want them to repent even though that love might become tough love where we do things that they're going to complain about and if we're doing what god has said and they complain about it let them take that up with god which is we want to be wise about how we do things which is why we want to be controlled by the spirit and following his word jesus got blessed and uh, rewarded for loving righteousness and hating iniquity Good things to hate. God hates sin. We should too. Sometimes he even hates sinners. Um, and their bodies are scattered in the desert as evidence of that. Um, but Jesus, love righteousness, hate and equity, therefore God, even thy God, reference to um, the Old Testament quote from this and showing that uh, God is called God by God, Trinity evidence. He has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. So uh, Jesus' right to rule with his companions, the overcomers, the Metacoi, sharers of Hebrews as a theme, um, is dependent upon his loving righteousness, hating wickedness, and doing what God wanted. Uh, Jesus said in his uh, post-resurrection and ascension uh, epistles to the churches, uh, I didn't change it out of King James, uh, but this you have going for you. Uh, to see you. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Um, nobody knows for sure what the deeds are of the Nicolaitans, and he mentions it in two different passages, and it's there's, there's nothing historical that they've got. Um, Nico uh, means uh, rule, and Galatians means laity. So it's ruling over the laity or having the laity rule. Um, first is authoritarian oppression. Uh, the second is democracy, uh, where the loudest voices rule. So whatever it is, uh, it, hate is a legitimate thing. And God actually favors people who hate the right stuff. Um, so probably doesn't hate those who hate the wrong stuff. Um, and to avoid the defilement, uh, we're told in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, to keep no company with believers who behave badly. Not with unbelievers, but with believers who behave badly. And 2 Thess says, don't even eat with them. So there comes a point where you don't want to become like the people you're trying to minister to. The missionary agencies had a term for this called going native. which is going to the place and they basically, you know, eventually wouldn't hear from them. They'd send someone to investigate, and they discovered that they were partying with the pagans, and become, had become basically pagans themselves. Not lose their salvation, just believers behaving badly. It's not a good thing. Any questions so far? Yeah, by hate, it does not mean the emotional intensity. Um, yeah, hate has a number of elements. One is not to be loyal to it, not have a covenantal relationship with it, not hang around it, not embrace it. Um, so it's, in you know, First John, he uh, says he loves God and hates his brother as a liar. Um, so it's not just the emotional thing, but it's a refusal to have relationships that is in view there, as you understand the book. So uh, you can hate the sin when you look at how much damage it does. You hate the demon who has engendered it in their lives and nudged people towards it. Um, but 
person you don't want to hate. Avoid them? Yeah. We're actually committed to do that. It's the last stage of uh, trying to help them. So B, understanding needs of the person requires Holy Spirit guided, which means you need to be praying, other centered, which means you think you be thinking about what's going on in the head and lives of the other person. Empathetic, you want to feel their pain. Oh, I hate that. I got enough pain on my own. Why do I need to feel someone else's pain? Um, well, Jesus felt our pain to be able to save us, so uh, we might have to do that as well. Other centered observation of the person's needs and their tendencies, as well as evidence for reproof. Most people do not take an interest in others because they're too self-absorbed. But if you want to help someone or save them, you first got to discern the needs or from what do they need to be saved? They're not functioning in the Christian life. What's gone wrong? That's going to be the next screen. Um, exactly what do they need to be saved from and why? How did they get into that? And we need to be listening and observing. Um, and in that process of listening and observing and taking interest in them, we listen to what they say. And in that process, we hopefully earn a hearing. Um, I remember once I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to help someone. And uh, I shared something with them. Uh, they were thinking of making a really stupid career move. Uh, they were dead set on doing the wrong thing because they had this uh, emotional fixation on something. And they, they basically, um, you have no right to tell me this because you, know, you, you don't know everything I've said, ever said. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I wasn't there when you were five, feeling with your parents. I'm sorry. Uh, it turns out I said the right thing, and somehow, by the grace of God, they heeded it, and they actually have been benefited ever since up until this day. But they were rejecting it because, oh, you didn't hear me. Well, yeah, I did hear you. This is what you said. And if you were listening to me, you would understand that I couldn't be saying what I'm saying unless I heard and understood what you're saying. But, of course, they couldn't get that because they were too self-absorbed. So other-centeredness, you do want to earn a hearing. Um, you don't need to know all their life story. If someone is about ready to step over a cliff or walk over a bridge that has a plank that's missing, you don't say, well, let's have a little talk about what's been going on in your life in your early childhood so I can tell you not to jump off this cliff with your next step. The, the word for uh, snatching them out of the fire uh, should come to mind that there's some urgency to this. So the reason why most people don't observe others, they aren't other-centered, is because they're self-absorbed. The reason why they're self-absorbed is because their needs aren't being met. And the reason their needs aren't being met is because they have a primary relationship with Christ. So, do you know that you need to, you're commanded to speak and do uh, according to the royal law of liberty? Do you know that you will be judged, the specific text is, you will be judged by the law of liberty. Do you have any idea what the law of liberty is? You're going to be judged by it. Promise in scripture. And James too. So speak and do as those will be judged by the law of liberty. But you look through James to try to figure out what in the world is the law of liberty. Um, why I think it sums it up on daily truth base is God meets our needs so we're free to meet the needs of others. Uh, God meets our needs and serves us so we're free to meet the needs and serve others and having my needs met by God means I can focus on another person and not try to use them to meet my needs oh my need to be worthwhile is met by trying to help you so let me help you across the street and the little old lady said I don't want to go across the street <laughs> I'm trying to go that way and, yeah so you know it's like we try to Young Christians, you'll see sometimes, they're good in that they kind of catch this idea you're supposed to help others, but they haven't really done the preparation in their own life so that they are you know, Holy Spirit-led in observing what's going on in someone else's life. And in our body, uh, you get to know people, you can hear their praises, you can hear their uh, edifications, and you can get a read on what their needs are. Uh, it comes out, and uh, if you're listening for it, and then you can figure out what is the best way 
to achieve God's purposes for this person. Some of the needs that you can observe, and I think some of the things that cause people the most problem, is immaturity. They're still babies, right? They have not desired and craved and fed themselves on the pure milk of the word and they're growing. They are still toddlers running around in diapers. Um, and they're fairly unpleasant. But that is, why can I say 90% of most congregations, maybe 85% of most, uh, are in that state. And if you got a pastor who was really honest and really understood that, you know, making disciples is teaching people to obey, how many people in your congregation actually are obeying, uh, actively understanding how to obey and obeying God's word and helping someone else do that? They would probably say one or two percent. Oh yeah, there's Joe. He's on six committees. We made sure that he is on so many committees and doing so many things around the church that he never gets any contact with people that he can actually help obey the scriptures. There's some sarcasm and irony and other things in there. I missed that. Immaturity is the biggie, and the, the word solves that. Disease. They're diseased. That's why people don't reproduce. They're diseased. Um, they've got stuff in their lives that is sapping their strength. It, it, they're weak. They have, an, they have an undeveloped faith. Uh, they also could have an undeveloped immune system. So when Satan dangles a little temptation before them, they just stumble. Boom, I'll take it. So those are factors mainly within them. And there's some other stuff, uh, the bad stuff. Um, they're not good, they're bad. They have a bad diet. They're not intaking the word, pure milk of the word. They're intaking, um, you know, all these other things. Uh, I, I listened to this uh, daily devotion thing to see what is being taught and promoted by what used to be good publishing houses. And uh, it's on Amanda in the morning. And uh, at least half the time, I have to force myself. I, I, I don't succeed. I have her skip. But it's an effort for me to hear how bad stuff is. Case in point this week, which actually applies to what we're going to be looking at in a few minutes. Um, this is guy. He's a good speaker. He was a lawyer. Uh, he's all about love. And he tells the story of uh, when he graduated from law school, his, uh, he bought a yellow pickup truck from his dad. And he signed a check to his dad. Dad tossed him the keys, goes outside into this new truck that now he owns. And then tap, 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 his dad taps on the window and says, you'll be wanting to change the oil in that. And then he rode away. Um, I rode away. The guy was doing a daily devotion. The lawyer was probably a sort of pastor who writes books about Christianity. And he said, boy, it's my pickup truck. This is like 25-year-old guy. He, he can't tell me what to do. And every time he would visit his dad, his dad would say, don't forget to be changing your oil, because he knew that his son was not good about stuff like that. And the guy said, he's not going to tell me what to do. No one tells me what to do. I wouldn't change the oil even if I had five quarts of oil and a funnel and a filter right on my front seat until I'm good and ready to change the oil. And trucks die without getting oil. You know, it's like you need all the engine seasons. And then he, his view is that all the world is as rebellious and childish as he is. So his theology now is you shouldn't tell anybody what to do. Then he goes from being just stubborn and stupid to demonic. He said, and in the scriptures, God never tells us what to do. He tells us who we are. Uh, 613 commands in each testament. So, one, two, two, six. <laughs> um, and the Great Commission being teaching people to obey, and the commands to teach and admonish one another. And this guy says, he never tells you uh, any, what to do. He told Peter, um, you, you're a rock, you're going to leave my church. So Peter became a rock and led his church. Um, he told, oh, Joseph, you're a prisoner and became a prisoner. Just stupid stuff. He, this is it. He told Jonah that you're fish food, so he became fish food. And I thought, who is this Looney Tune? And who is the editor who allowed this and the publisher who promoted this garbage? God tells us a little bit about who we are, 
but a lot about what we are supposed to do. And you can't become what he wants unless you do the stuff that you want. Oh, I'm a child of God. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. And I can just go out and sin boldly because it's all a grace. Words of salvation, demonically influenced. So you, you get, if you have a diet like that, where everything was done at the cross and you can't do anything, you will not have a mature faith. You will not be pleasing to God. You have no fear of God. Uh, values and habits. We talked a little bit about front, but this is the key. Uh, way back when I, uh, you know, like 39 years ago, I came to this realization. Why do people sin? Why do I sin? Um, and when I don't want to, it just I have a habit, and those habits become automatic. So bad habits, uh, you know, eliminate our sanctification. They keep us stuck in the mud. We've got to change those habits, but to change the habit, we have to change the value. To change the value, we have to sit down and reprogram how we respond to things and envision new responses and hold ourselves accountable to someone until it happens. Bad environments, that would include families. Um, you know, one of the things I think has hindered most people is their, uh, the influence on their life is not the Holy Spirit, it's not the scripture, it's not godly people, it's ungodly parental influences and ungodly companions. They hang around the wrong people. I noticed this when I was teaching at New York School of the Bible that um, I would spend hours on Monday night undoing what uh, people had heard the previous Sunday and then get to a point where I could actually teach some truth, only to have it undone by the Wednesday night meeting, the Sunday, Saturday morning Bible study, and the previous next Sunday is Sunday school and uh, sermon, and by the time I got it back again Monday, it was like all that I had built the previous week was washed out by bad teaching. Do not be deceived. Evil, not good, company corrupts good habits. If you think otherwise, you are deceived. The next verse, awake to righteousness. They're sleeping. They're sleeping in sin. They're deceived. And do not sin. The better translation, I couldn't have put it on your line, was stop sinning. What are they sitting in? They're hanging around the wrong people, and they're not developing the good habits. And they think that they can be pleasing to God without that deceived demonic. You have no knowledge of God. You don't know God. You don't know what he's going to do. You have no fear of God, therefore you don't have wisdom, you don't have knowledge, you don't have understanding. And he says, I say this to your shame, which means you are going to be ashamed of it. Shame is something that we all try to avoid, right? I don't want to go out and be ashamed in front of everybody today. You know, the lengths that we go to to avoid shame are amazing. Um, but we kind of don't talk about it because we're ashamed of it. Uh, and doing something, I came across this verse, and uh, it's in the context of a famous passage, uh, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Nobody reads the rest of it about regathering Israel, but here's the next one. Your heart is deceitful above all things. The most wicked thing about you is how you make your decisions. It's incurably and desperately wicked. Desperately wicked is kind of concept of incurably. Who can know it? You don't even know how deceived you are about what pleases God and what doesn't. Next verse. I, the Lord, Yahweh, search or investigate the heart. I know what's going on. And then I test or try the mind to give to every man and woman according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings, and I'd be said according to what their deeds deserve. God searches and investigates your heart. He knows what's on there. The New Testament says everything's thoughts and intents of the heart are going to be laid bare. So you got to make sure your heart's in the right place. The word for test or try. It's used of metallurgy. It's in Psalm 11. He tests the righteous. He tries the righteous. He actually puts tests in our life, temptations in our life, to see if we're going to pass them. 
We don't have to have those for people. We just use it for desires that we have in our heart. And um, I think most of us have trouble passing the test. And, you know, C is a good day. Uh, but he, he notice he does the heart and the mind, the thinking. This word is used in Psalm 139. Uh, Try me, O God, know my heart. Lead me in the way of life everlasting. We should be asking God to reveal what's in our heart because if we don't, we won't know what's in there. And we will follow the wrong things, make the wrong decisions. And when we stand before the God of the scriptures, um, we will be shamed rather than pleased. Yes. Right. The essence of sin is independence from God. We don't even care about what he thinks. Then if you know what he does, but you fail to do it, you know what he wants and fail to do it. The scriptures say that's sin. He knows what to do and fails to do it. That's sin. And, you know, unfortunately, most people sit in church, regardless of how bad the sermons are, here's the stuff that you should and shouldn't do that's in there. But they all think, oh, that applies to everyone else because I accepted Christ and did. So how do we save people out of this deception? How do we save them out of the certain fire and judgment that they are going to face? How do we save them from falling into the hands of the living God who is a consuming fire? Ah, oh, we don't care. I'm good. No, if we're not working on trying to save others, I don't think we can say we're good. So when I was doing this, I thought, wow, I got like a whole Bible to try to figure out. <laughs> There's like all these verses on what we're supposed to do. I came up with a few. I'm sure I could have done better. I know there are gazillions more. Gazillion, that's a big number. Um, and I'm going to focus on one simple thing because this is addressed to people in a church. And this is biblical fellowship is what saves us. Not having coffee and donuts with others. Although donuts are a good starting point. Um, but it's sharing the life of Christ. To have in common. God, that's God's plan because he commands us to have fellowship. And as I thought about why are there so many people who have walked away from the faith that I know and so few who have followed Christ to the next town. And the difference has really been fellowship and involvement with someone else in your life to, to move them in the right direction. And if you guys think through your life, the reason why you're here today is because someone else has taken an interest in you and loved you. That is a form of fellowship. Fellowship saves both by example. So that's, I love our praise time because we have examples of how uh, people um, have called on God, trusted God, and it worked. And in our edification time, we have examples of how people are learning things that they apply to their lives. So there's both example and edification, which is also purposefully building one and other up. Meeting together, talking about your relationship with God, how are your, the goals are that you're trying to pursue to please God. Edification reinforces the good. Encouragement comes to happen there. You're doing great. Keep it up. I'll pray for you. And admonishes, puts in the right mind about the wrong direction. And my favorite one, wrong-headedness. <laughs> Your head ain't in the right spot. You're wrong-headed. Uh, it's more of a southern thing, I think. Um, you heard that down south? You mean wrong-headed? I have not. Oh, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a Texan thing. All right. So, you know, you're saying that, that Proverbs does it. You're in the wrong direction. But also there's lots of verses that says you're being wrong-headed. You're thinking incorrectly. You are transformed, metamorphosized, and pleasing to God as a living sacrifice only by the renewing of your mind. And there's so few people who have a renewed mind, maybe because they have to put off the old first. So uh, first I was looking for fire verses. Um, I came across one, and uh, here it is. Hinge of Hebrews. Uh, this is after a look of all the things we have in Christ. It's better than anything they had in Judaism. And he says, let's progress in faith, hope, and love. And here he says, let's hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Oh, yeah, Jude talked about 
uh, building yourself up in your most holy faith, contending for the faith, holding fast the faith that God, the person of Jesus Christ, will come back to judge and reward. Next chapter talks about faith. All these people receive testimony from God that they pleased him because without faith, you can't please him. You need to hold that truth without ever wavering, not even quivering, not even getting a little bit off balance because he is faithful that promised we can do that. So holding fast my faith personally, now let us consider one another, study one another, observe one another, do some Holy Spirit inspired praying for one another. And we're considering how we can provoke, incite to love and good deeds. It's the word for provoke is a riot. And then it tells us how to affect that. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, <clears throat> as is the manner of some, but instead, Encourage and exhort one another, paracleto one another, be a model and call others to follow, and do it so much the more as you see the day approaching when you know the deeds are going to get judged and people who are not um, faithful are going to suffer. But wait, there's more. Next verse. If we don't do this, if we don't do this, we're sinning. If we sin willy, willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, bad consequences happen. People who have received the epigenosis of the truth, they were walking in the right direction and have wandered off the path, willfully exerting their will over odds, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Original context, this was of the Hebrew Christians being pressured to go back to Judaism and giving back into it. Their families, their jobs, every the community, everybody was pressuring them. Don't do the Messiah thing, come back and do the Judaism thing. If you do that, there's no more sacrifice for sins because the sacrifice is only found in Christianity and this is in Judaism. Application for today is the provision for our sins is found in walking with Christ. We confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if you walk away from him, then uh, you don't go to the lake of fire, but your sins are not going, they're going to be still sticking to you when you get to the judgment seat. Some sins will follow people to the judgment seat. So instead of getting the cleansing and forgiveness, you get what verse 27 talks about, a sure and fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation. I think it's fire of fire. It's like two different words for fire in there. And it's like, God is pissed and he's going to burn you. That is scary. It's going to devour those who are adversaries. And then he gives an example of this. The one who despised or disregarded Moses' law. So it's not just about, you know, is Jesus the Messiah or not? But the whole, you know, instructions that God gave died without mercy on the testimony of one or two witnesses. Gathering firewood on the Sabbath. Yeah, he was, that's what he was doing. Here's the wood. Stone. Whoa, that's harsh. But there's something harsher. And that's what's coming for those who sin willfully. How much more severe punishment do you suppose a person will be felt worthy of who has this God? They've trodden underfoot the Son of God, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as common, unholy, profane thing, and this the spirit of grace. Wow. So that's what they were doing when they went back to Judaism. They were repudiating the Son of God. They were ignoring the covenant that he wanted to make with them. They were treating their sanctification as, ah, who cares? Nothing. And have totally resisted and dissed the spirit of grace that wants to provide strength and grace and forgiveness to them. Vengeance belongs to me. I will pay him back. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, just in case you missed it, the Lord shall judge his people. Count on it. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Scary. These are not people who have, are going to the lake of fire. 
these are people, you know, depart from me. I don't, I don't know you. Not by man, bind a man, but throw in the outer darkness as we've been initially teeth. Away with them, off of his head. It's being deprived of the blessings in the future, of not being able to be into the presence of God. Uh, just take a look at Daily Truth based on Ezekiel 20, 45, and there should be some other cross references to get you going on that one. So, this is written to believers. This is something that should cause fear. Is anything that they're doing worth this future that goes on for at least a thousand years? Ephesians 4 talks about another element of fellowship, and that's what biblical fellowship is, encouraging people to not get hit by the judgment. Um, gifted men were given to build up the church so they would no longer be demonically influenced children. Right, to paraphrase the summary of the text. But instead, they've grown up by means of speaking the truth in love to one another. The thing they grow up in is the headship of Jesus. This is the first form of church growth. People become better connected to the head, not addicted to pastor, teacher, but to the head, Christ. From Christ, when they are connected to him, the whole body, functioning as it's supposed to, every you know, part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the continued edifying or building up of itself in the realm of love. We speak the truth in love to build up the body in love. Earlier in the book, chapter 1, verse 4, and a leader in Jude, he wants us blameless. One of the things we're supposed to be blameless in is love. God's whole purpose is for us to be blameless in the realm of love, which is doing what's in other, each other's best interest, which is friends don't let friends sin. I was going to say friends don't let friends root for the 49ers, but friends don't let yeah. friends. <laughs> friends don't let friends <laughs> with uh, <laughs> As driving to Florida, we were praying for and cheering for the Chiefs. I was so disappointed there. <laughs> I don't really know the words up my nose. But they came back, back from behind. It was it was great. Okay. I'm sure God will forgive all those who rooted for the 49ers. <laughs> but he will remember, though, if we have been blameless in our love without a fault. Um, you know, reading through what others have said about this passage that we're looking at in Jude. Um, someone said something like, how would you like it if someone came back to you? If only someone, maybe even you had said something to me, I would not have gone off that path. Which I think is a pretty contrived statement. Because for the most part, we don't think about how we got into the mess we're in. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit was probably telling you, uh, the teaching that you heard from the pulpit was probably telling you, Holy Spirit was working through many means to show you that you missed it. But until someone gets in front of us and tells us things we don't want to hear, we don't hear it. And even then we often don't want to hear it. And we will continue on our, what we think is merry way, until we get destruction. So wisdom from above is something that we should have. And we're going to look at wisdom Again, uh, before we finish, Jude, when it shows up. It's easily entreated, it's not stubborn. And if you don't have wisdom from above, you know what? You are demonically self-seeking, and the proverb says you're a fool. It's wisdom or folly. Wisdom from above is easily entreated. Oh, thanks for telling me that. Let me consider that. The, the, when a person comes to you, to maybe bring up something you don't want to hear, you might want to ask yourself, is this person out to get me? And Satan will probably say, yeah, they are. But then, then think about it. Why are they even bothering to talk to you? Oh, because so they don't like me. Well, if that was true, why don't they like you? Uh, maybe I'm just doing sinful, selfish things that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, it might be that. The rapper is pretty dirty. Or maybe that they are fulfilling their biblical obligation and 
they're guided by the spirit and they might have been helpful in your life in the past so you might want to think about has god used this person in your life before maybe they'll continue to do it um and then you realize that whenever someone is trying to reprove you they're taking a risk they are you know um someone who is wise is at least being treated they're not going to be like israel's put their little hooves in and stiffen their neck and push back i just get, get a kick out every time i see these little dogs you know trying to pull their you know, 200 pound owner <laughs> their way um so it went across the street and the dog puts its paws on the sidewalk i'm like you know and, and the person could just like pick up the dog with two fingers there <laughs> No butterkins. Okay. Um, if the guilt fits, wear it. Because if you're being called out, it's obvious. It's gotten odious, which is why it's being done. And it, it might not be right. Um, that's why this whole process of church discipline, if the person sins against you, you tell you bring others and establish everything. You can, you can see the whole church things. Um, so... Yeah, you, you're, you're going to feel shame. Um, the best thing is to purpose to never feel that shame because you are looking to God in your quiet time. Try me, oh God. Search me. See if I'm doing anything that's displeasing to you and guide me to change. If you were doing that, you'd never have to be shamed of having someone have to come and do this to you. Right? And uh, you should be thankful that uh, God it loves you enough that he has another person love you when you're very unlovely. Um, and if you choose to go, you know, be self-seeking and unyielding, um, you, you know, are going to lose. Blue lotus flower works really good. <laughs> oh, do, do I have a suggestion for when your, feel, your emotions are overwhelmed, uh, and you your sort of, for guilt and shame, and you short circuit. Uh, for the person who is uh, trying to help, yeah, you, you kind of need to wait until the uh, adrenaline comes down, and you know, it might take a couple of, of attempts. Um, it's like sometimes logical work, but sometimes uh, it's just uh, laying back and waiting for more opportune time. Uh, just like Satan tempts us, and if it doesn't work, he'll wait for another more opportune time. We can actually use one of his tactics, <laughs> uh, is waiting for more opportune time. So wisdom from above is also exchanging time to know and do God's will. That's godliness. They're, they're using their time to grow in godliness. They're using their time to have a quiet time. And, you know, through the years, people who have quiet times, or somebody wrote in a Bible that once gave me, this book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. <laughs> People are having quiet times. Usually, God's word is keeping them from sin. People who don't have quiet times, their sin is keeping them from the scriptures. So as he says in Ephesians 5, 8, you are light. Walk in light. Have no fellowship, no participation, no sharing with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove or expose them. All things that are exposed are made manifest by your life and your words, your light. He says to the person who is sleeping in their sin, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. A sinful, sleeping believer is really viewed by God as in the realm of the dead. You need to rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light, and then you'll be light again, you can walk in the light. I'm going to come back to this first one to do the wisdom part. See then that you walk circumcised. Especially not as fools, but as wise, buying back the time. Because the days we live in are not promoting goodness, they're promoting evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then the next verse is, don't be drunk with wine. It's dissipation. It's just a, it's a waste. You have a distorted view of reality. It's one of the ways Satan uses to deceive you. But instead of being controlled by escapism, be controlled or filled with the Holy Spirit. So exchanging the time, redeeming the time, buy back the time to know and do God's will. Otherwise, you'll wind up doing Satan's will. And you go the really dark demon part of thinking that what you're doing is God's will 
because you've made your will God's will as opposed to his will your will. So, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show forth you know, their wisdom and understanding by works done in the meekness of wisdom. So meekness is one of those fruits of the spirit. It's getting down off your horse to help someone else. Being willing to you know, get dirty, but not defiled. And wisdom is kind of figuring out what's the right objective and what's the right way of attaining objective. Where you have envy and self-seeking as opposed to God-seeking in your hearts, you lie and you're not following the truth. Uh, earthly wisdom, sensual wisdom, demonic wisdom um, is of Satan, not of the Holy Spirit. So where you see self-seeking, a uh, person only looks at things from an earthly perspective, they have no faith that the sensual is like only what you can see, touch, taste, and smell. Here we go. I probably hear us another one. Um, I was surprised to see envy show up twice on this list. Uh, envy must be a bad thing. I envy those who know exactly what it means. Uh, there's confusion. Every evil thing is there. So you will basically unleash a hailstorm of demonic opposition when you try to save someone from his grasp. So wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. Your life is pure. Your motives are pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's willing to yield. Full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and the biggie without hypocrisy. So you take heed to yourself first. You remove the lot from your eye before you look at the speck in the other's eye. Or if you're at the point where you're making disciples, you remove the speck from your eye before you try to dislodge the log that's kind of sticking through the head of the other person. And the fruit of righteousness is shown in peace by those who make peace. So you're trying to bring a person in harmony with God and uh, once they're in harmony with the head, harmony with the others follows. Okay, well, I'll get sorry, I'm good. I'm going over. Uh, this one, flaming fire. Uh, I was amazed how the passage in Hebrews talking about fire never showed up in any commentator I read, nor did this passage. And then I was looking at this passage and I realized, wait a minute. They mistranslated this. Went back to the Greek and sure it did. So God's coming. Jesus is coming back. In flaming fire, he is going to take vengeance on them that do not know God. And second group, on those that don't obey the good news about our Lord. And then later in the passage, the Greek order, it's Jesus, Messiah. So the big thing is they don't obey the good news about the Lordship. Two groups. Other versions eliminate this word. This, this is one Greek word. It's the same as this Greek word up here. On them and on those, same word. And they try to make it one group. Oh, they don't know God and they don't obey the gospel. If that were the case, it would be they don't know God and don't believe the gospel. This is the obedience that comes from faith that Paul is trying to produce in Romans and in every letter that he wrote. So those who don't obey can look forward to a fiery future where it burns up everything you have given your life for. And then you get an eternity of regret. Well, at least a thousand years. Of, yeah, it's an eternity. Um, it's a thousand years outside uh, the outer darkness, and then you're excluded from the heavenly city. Um, if you want, probably the best thing, it is by far the best thing I've ever read on uh, End Times. It's uh, daily truth face, sorry. Um, oh, it's chapter 20, 21? Yeah. Chapter 21 of what? Revelation. Uh, Send that to anyone. It, it is, you know, I've read scores of books on that, and I've read tens of thousands of quotes that related to the, uh, the future. And uh, I hadn't seen this in six years, and it was recently brought to my attention. And I listened to that as it was being said, and I said, wow, that, I wish I had seen that when I first started seminary. I could have got, the seminary education is just in that one post. It's phenomenal. <laughs> Even if I do say myself, I know I should let someone else praise me, but, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Send it to anyone who, you know, that along with uh, some 
uh, rewarding verses to consider. It really spells out the future, and I actually was pretty uh, oh, I to be oriented in it, where I was uh, knocking down the arguments that people would raise before they raised them. Okay, God is coming back. He's going to take vengeance on those who don't obey him. They will be punished. Now, this is the second group. Punished with the destruction of the age, and that punishment is going to be away from the presence of the Lord. You do not, you're not, you're not pure in heart, so you're not going to see God. You can't enter into his presence, uh, Ezekiel 45. You will be punished also away from the glory of his power. You're not going to share in his power. And that's going to happen when he comes to be glorified in his saints. You're not going to be there to get glory. You are not getting the glorified body. You're going to be one of those naked Christians that Paul didn't want to be himself. When he comes to be admired among all them that believe. So he's going to come, be admired, glorified, and you're going to be there, but you're going to be experiencing punishment. Receive according to what you've done in the body, whether good or evil. Reference Luke 12. Um, and Paul then prays that God would count them worthy of this calling that we're called to. Oh, wow. Is there time for this? No. Um, James said, brethren, if any of you wonders from the truth and someone turn him back, you had to observe that they have wondered. You've got to reprove them and brought it into light. You have to encourage them to repent and get God's forgiveness. And then you're going to have to make sure that they don't uh, feel defeated. It's just, okay, this is what happens. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But the past is past. We, you know, you, there's two ways of looking at it. Say, well, let him know that you, the person who you've just turned from the error of their way, so you have done it, will save their soul from death. Destruction. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mind, will, and emotions. And you will cover a multitude of sins. And this is one of those passages that like these all kinds of things that, well, God will forgive it that covers it. That really isn't the right, correct use of this word, cover. Um, it's not an atonement word. Um, it could cover over and prevent sins, but that is not, you know, uh, that's probably the best, most, uh, you know, used explanation of that by those who actually know how to exegete. Um, the other option could be that it uh, love covers over a multitude of sins, says Proverbs, what, 10, 12, or something like that. Um, it's, you don't bring it up again. It's done, it's passed, it's buried. And uh, that, that could be the thing. Or it could just prevent them from committing more. Uh, we don't know. But that is actually a form of blessing. So I think that's the end. Yeah, go out there and save some souls. <laughs> uh, start by giving people the lie and truth even. Say, do you believe, you know, which of these do you think is true? Can you really become, please God, without being Christ-like? And can you become Christ-like without changing your inner thinking so it's like Christ? And if you ever find yourself being reproved, be so grateful for that person. Oh, I'm so glad you told me that. Although initially you might think, oh, you're just not you just talking to me about him. Then go to God and ask God is there any truth to this. Go ask someone else. And uh, see how God works uh, through the body to help you become more like Jesus. You'll, you know, rejoice over it for an eternity. Any questions? Going, going, gone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are concerned about our lives uh, in every facet, in every way, throughout all of our stay here on earth. Uh, thank you that you sent Jesus to die for us so we could be brought into a relationship with you. Thank you that you put your spirit within our hearts to cause us to will and do your good pleasure. And thank you that you created the body as a means of helping us know if we are actually doing what is pleasing in your sight or not. Lord, I pray you would... Uh, Search our hearts and minds to see if there's any way that is unpleasing to you um, that is causing us to miss the path to happily ever after. And I pray you would guide us to it. Thanks for the people you put in our life who have uh, risked much to uh, in the relationship to tell us uh, that 
or just to bring to light behaviors that might not be pleasing to you. May we be grateful for their boldness, even if it might not be correct. May we look for any grain of truth in what they say, so that we can be more pleasing in your sight and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Look forward to that. Christ's name, amen.